Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for coming. Um, this is the annual William H. Timbers Lecture, which is co-sponsored with the Dartmouth Lawyers Association and the Dartmouth Legal Studies faculty. Thank you um, to both of those groups, and as always, to the Rockefeller Center, who always brings us such exceptional speakers and events. And a very special thank you to Joanne Needham, who's up there, who really is the one who makes everything happen. Um, thank you. So. In May of 1995, a Dartmouth Endowment Fund was established in memory of the Honorable William H. Timbers, who was class of 1937, by the legal firm of Skadden, Arp, Slate, Meager, and Flom, for whom Timbers once practiced. Judge Timbers was an esteemed lawyer and judge of the U.S. District Court for Connecticut and later judge of the U.S. Of, of Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. The fund is used to support activities related to the study of law and justice within the Faculty of Arts and Scientists, Sciences, as well as to support visiting speakers, panel discussions, and conferences on topics relating to the law. Previous lecturers have included Robin West, Daniel Markovitz, Michael Moore, Una Hathaway, Stephen Morse, Catherine McKinnon, Martha Nussbaum, and Thomas Penfield Jackson. This year's Timberless Lecture will be given by Pam Carlin, the Kenneth and Harl Montgomery Professor of Public Interest Law at Stanford Law School. She also co-directs Stanford's Supreme Court Litigation Clinic, which has five cases currently pending before the court this term. Uh, Professor Carlin received her BA, MA, and JD all from Yale. After clerking for Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman, she practiced law at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. And during, the 2014, during 2014 and 2015, she served as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, where she received the Attorney General's Award for Exceptional Service for work in implementing the Supreme Court's decision in U.S. v. Windsor as well as the John Marshall Award for providing legal advice for her work in guiding the department to its new position regarding Title VII and gender identity. Carlin is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Academy of Appellate Lawyers, and the American Law Institute, and she has co-authored leading case books on constitutional law, constitutional litigation, and the law of democracy. The title of Professor Carlin's talk is Rights and Rights, the Supreme Court, Voting and Marriage Equality. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for uh, having me. It's been really delightful being here today. I too want to thank Joanne Needham. Um, but I also want to thank the students that I've met with over the past couple of hours who have just been uh, exceptionally wonderful. I feel like I should have viewed this as a recruiting trip, like a football coach or something, and just signed them to letters of intent right while I was here. Um, so I appreciate very much the opportunity to have met with them as well. Um, equal justice under law. Those inspiring words are inscribed on the architrave over the 16 marble columns at the front entrance of the Supreme Court. I spent a lot of time looking at and thinking about those words in April 2015 when I went to the court to hear the oral argument in the marriage equality cases. I spent a lot of time looking at them. A lot of time. There are two tall flagpoles uh, in front of the Supreme Court on the plaza, and I saw those words, equal justice under law, and the star-spangled banner, both at the twilight's last gleaming and in the dawn's early light. Oral argument in the marriage cases was set for Tuesday, April 28th at 10 a.m. in the morning. I arrived at the court on Monday afternoon, April 27th at 2 p.m., to see the arguments the next day. I sat or stood in line for roughly 20 hours to get a seat in the bar section of the Supreme Court. I know you're thinking, why not the Grateful Dead? But it was, it was the Supreme Court who are not the Grateful Dead. Um, in one of those wonderful fortuities, the man who was standing directly in front of me in the line was a man named Gary O'Connor, uh, who's an assistant attorney general from Maryland. Um, and the reason I mention that is I'd met him only once before. And the place I met him was at the Supreme Court on a spring day in 2003 uh, in line, in the bar section line for the oral argument in Lawrence against Texas, the case in which the Supreme Court struck down Texas's law 
on homosexual sodomy. That time, in 2003, I'd arrived at the court at 5 a.m. the morning of the oral argument, and I found myself the second person in the line. Uh, Gary was the third person. This time, by contrast, uh, we were almost a full day earlier, and there were dozens of people ahead of us in the line. This is a line to sit in the bar section of the Supreme Court, so you need to be a member of the Supreme Court bar, which basically just means you need to be a lawyer, and you need to have been a lawyer for three years, and you need to know two people who will say that you don't have two heads and will sign your certificate. Uh, but most of the people ahead of us in the bar line at 2 p.m., the day before the argument, and an even greater share of the people in front of us in the bar line at 2 a.m. waiting for the argument were not, however, lawyers who were eager to see the arguments. They were paid line standers, hired by firms like linestanding.com, and billed out to clients at upwards of $50 an hour to hold places. This is the bar line for the Supreme Court. Two years earlier, I'd been the beneficiary of a paid line stander so that I could see the oral argument in the California marriage cases that were being argued the day before United States against Windsor, where I was representing Edie Windsor. Uh, we thought it would be a good idea for all of the lawyers on our team to be in the courtroom so that we could help prepare the lawyer who was going to be arguing the case. And I hadn't given much thought to the decision. This is a picture of us uh, from the Windsor team arriving at the court a little bit. This picture is taken a little bit before 6 a.m. Uh, and this woman over here is Mary Bonato, who argued the marriage, uh, marriage equality cases the next, uh, the two years later in Obergfell. Um, when I arrived at the court at 5 a.m. in the morning to claim my spot, I was stunned and ashamed to find a line, if you could call it that, composed almost entirely of middle-aged people of color, fast asleep on the ground, underneath moving blankets, and wearing several layers of clothing uh, in the light snow that had been happening. They'd apparently been recruited from nearby shelters to brave the 30 degree temperatures with whatever belongings they had. I stood there for two hours watching this line of sleeping homeless people of color morph into a line of affluent white lawyers. And I vowed then that I would never again pay a line stander to watch an oral argument. Which explains why two years later, I came on Monday equipped with two space blankets, mittens, Ibex wool wear, a rain poncho, camping urinals, a, floating ca a folding camp chair, an umbrella, and a Kindle fire lo loaded with a soundtrack of um, civil rights songs. Th that is me in that picture. I'm not that bloaty. That's just I'm wearing all of this stuff. Um, as the evening wore on, Volunteers dropped off water and cookies. This is a little boy dressed in a Superman costume. He was taking a uh, wagon up and down the line, giving people cookies and water. Uh, various friends stopped by to drop off hot meals and hand warmers. At around 11 p.m., some of the line standers uh, in the line uh, asked a few of us who were lawyers whether we would hold their places while they went back to their shelter to freshen up and take a nap. So for several hours in the darkest, coldest part of the night, we sat there keeping an eye on their empty chairs. This is a picture I took around 2 a.m. Uh, of the line. I later heard that although the paid line standers had been promised $10 an hour for their 48-hour shifts staying in the line, some of the companies told them midway through their time on the line that they would only get uh, $5 right now, and then they would have to come back for the other money later. And you can imagine because of the way a difficulty people who are homeless have in kind of managing their lives and their days, how likely it was that they'd actually collect all that money. While I was sitting there in the line, both Monday afternoon and Tuesday morning, I spoke to a number of court officials who'd come out to take in the scene. Uh, they seemed genuinely surprised by what they saw and taken aback. There were also several press reports, all of them critical. On first Monday in 2015, the Supreme Court's uh, Public Information Office announced a new rule for the bar line. Under the new rule, only bar members, I did the red on there so you can see the, the words most clearly, only bar members who actually intend to attend oral argument are, in la are allowed in line for the bar section. Line standers will not be permitted. In my talk today, what I want to do with you is to discuss an issue that hit me with special force as I stood and sat in that line for 20 hours. By 7 a.m. on the day of the oral argument in the marriage equality cases, it was a line of lawyers 
come to see a milestone in the struggle for LGBT equality. But in the night, it had been a line of homeless people for whom the promises of equality made over a century earlier had not yet been realized. That cold April morning was, in short, to paraphrase Charles Dickens, both the season of light and the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. For supporters of social equality for gay people, it was a spring of hope and a season of light, a moment in a struggle that had made stunning advances since the year I clerked at the Supreme Court when a majority of the justices joined an opinion treating the claim that gay people were constitutionally entitled to any respect for our relationships as being, in the court's words, at best, facetious. In 2003, in Lawrence against Texas, the court repudiated that view. And by the time the Supreme Court heard the Windsor case in 2013, the Chief Justice could observe at oral argument that political leaders are falling all over themselves to endorse marriage equality. Somewhat more elegantly, uh, Professor Barack Obama joined Stonewall to Selma and to Seneca Falls in the litany of guiding stars in our journey for American equality when he celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Great Voting Rights March. Within days after the court's decision in Obergefell in the summer of 2015, local officials across the nation began issuing marriage licenses to gay and lesbian couples. Later that year, the Attorney General of the United States announced a change in the government's interpretation of Title VII to cover discrimination on the basis of gender identity. And this is the team that uh, received the John Marshall Award that Julie mentioned a moment ago, receiving our awards uh, from uh, the, the Attorney General. And this is the, this is the team of us uh, who worked on that. Uh, to be sure, there's been resistance. Kim Davis, state religious freedom acts, the defeat of Houston's Equal Rights Ordinance, the massacre in Orlando, a so-called conscience law in Mississippi, and the threat of a similar executive order from the new administration in Washington. But to quote Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., although we ain't what we should be and we ain't what we're gonna be, thank God we ain't what we was. But for supporters of political equality for persons of color, these past few terms at the Supreme Court have been as much a winter of despair and a season of darkness as anything else. Most strikingly, in the same week in which the Supreme Court struck down the Federal Defense of Marriage Act in Windsor, it also struck down a key provision of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 in the Shelby County case. That provision, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, required jurisdictions like Texas that had a long history of racial discrimination in voting to prove that any new law they wanted to put into effect about voting would have neither a discriminatory purpose nor a discriminatory effect. Here, too, the reaction was swift, and it was decisive. Within days of the voting rights decision, states began to impose restrictive new election laws, including Texas's draconian voter ID requirements, which had previously been blocked by the Department of Justice. States drew redistricting plans that reduce minority voting strength. States have cut back on access to same-day registration and to early voting and to Sunday voting. And states have enacted other barriers to full minority political participation. So what accounts for the fact that, to paraphrase Dickens again, one set of claims seem to be going direct to heaven while the others seem to be going direct the other way? Reading the court's decisions in the marriage equality cases up against its decision in the Shelby County case is to enter a world of strange parallels and disjunctures. First, both DOMA, the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, and the Voting Rights Act involved striking assertions of federal power in areas that were traditionally left to state regulation. So section three of DOMA, uh, which is part of something called the Dictionary Act, where the government just defines a bunch of terms, um, that's where, for example, if you're wondering why the word person includes corporations, in part it's because the Dictionary Act says so. Uh, so Section 3 of DOMA created, for the first time, a federal definition of marriage, specifically for the purpose of displacing state definitions of marriage that extended to same-sex couples. Sections 4 and 5 of the Voting Rights Act created, for the first time, 
a requirement that certain states and political subdivisions, uh, primarily but not exclusively in the South, obtain federal approval before making any change to their election laws. In both cases, the court expressed skepticism about this dramatic shift. Justice Kennedy's opinion for the court in Windsor repeated an earlier observation he'd made in another gay rights case, Romer against Evans, that discriminations of an unusual character especially suggest careful consideration to determine whether they are obnoxious to the constitutional provision. The Chief Justice's opinion for the court in Shelby County, with its insistence that extraordinary legislation otherwise unfamiliar to our federal system could be justified only by exceptional conditions, echoed his earlier uh, remark in the Affordable Care Act case that there, while there's a first time for everything, sometimes the most telling indication of a severe constitutional problem is the lack of historical precedent for Congress's action. One of the most striking features of the opinions is the vastly different way in which the cases thought about the interrelationship between federalism and equal rights. This is a picture of uh, Edith Windsor, who was our client in United States Against Windsor, and Jim Obergfell, who was the lead plaintiff in the marriage equality cases involving state laws uh, on marriage. Uh, in the marriage cases, the court focused heavily on the equality and the dignity of same-sex couples. Claims of state autonomy were forced to give way to assertions of individual autonomy, what the syllabus the court handed out in Windsor called equal liberty of persons. And I just want, for any of you who are lawyers in the audience, you probably know that when the Supreme Court hands down a decision, it, come, it comes with a little summary at the front called the syllabus of decisions. And the syllabus isn't supposed to be part of the decision itself. Um, and the most striking thing in, to me about this is that the syllabus uses the phrase equal liberty of persons, which never appears anywhere in the opinion itself, um, but it captures an idea, this equal liberty of persons, about the mutually reinforcing uh, nature of the Equal Protection Clause with its protection of equality and the Due Process Clause with its protection of liberty. So those cases talked about equality and liberty for individual persons and for couples. By contrast, in Shelby County, Chief Justice Roberts' opinion for the court focused not on the values of political equality or dignity for minority voters who were the intended beneficiaries of the Voting Rights Act, but rather on the costs the Voting Rights Act imposed on the constitutional equality and the dignity of the states. That is, he used the same language about equality and dignity now to talk about states rather than persons. By treating states differently, he suggested, the Voting Rights Act undercut this kind of equality and this kind of dignity. And in reaching that conclusion, the court moved directly from an invocation of the intentions of the founders, uh, the framers of the Constitution, and the Tenth Amendment, which was uh, ratified in 1791, uh, to a characterization of the Voting Rights Act as sharply departing from those principles. He skipped over entirely the Reconstruction Amendments passed after the Civil War, not to mention a century's worth of uh, experience with their incomplete realization, and any discussion about how that understanding might change our understandings about the equality and dignity of the states. Similarly, when it came to the constitutional significance of changing social conditions, the racial justice cases and the marriage equality cases took very different routes. The conservative majority had no difficulty at all in the voting rights case recognizing constitution, what I call constitutionally dispositive change. Over the past half century, the century, half century between 1965 when the Voting Rights Act was passed and 2013, the Supreme Court had repeatedly upheld the use of preclearance against constitutional challenges. But although the act had been a constitutionally, a constitutionally acceptable response to the world of the 1960s, Chief Justice Roberts insisted that nearly 50 years later, things have changed dramatically. That change in the world, right, not in the document, but in the world itself, changed the strictures of the Constitution so that the act had to be justified by current needs, not by the needs at the time it was passed. So too, when it comes to race conscious affirmative action, the court has insisted that times have changed and therefore has indicated that uh, it's quite reluctant to use race conscious affirmative action 50 years after the second reconstruction. But in the marriage equality cases, 
The conservative justices challenged the idea that changes in social conditions should affect the constitutionality of state decisions about whether to restrict marriage or not. At the oral argument in Hollingsworth against Perry, for example, Justice Scalia demanded to know the following. When did it become unconstitutional to exclude homosexual couples from marriage? 1791? 1868, when the 14th Amendment was adopted? When the counsel for the challengers uh, responded that there was no specific date and time uh, because it was all part of an evolutionary cycle, Justice Scalia shot back, well, how am I supposed to know how to decide a case then if you can't give me a date when the Constitution changed? Now, I remember coming back from that argument and sitting around with the other lawyers in the Windsor case to discuss how would we answer that question if he asked it the next day in our case. And in one sense, there was a straightforward answer to that question. It was unconstitutional in 1996 when Congress enacted DOMA for the federal government to strip legally married gay couples of their rights simply because they were gay. And it was unconstitutional in the years following that for states to enact mini domas uh, to restrict marriage only to opposite sex couples. So as a doctrinal matter, I think that's the right answer. But of course, it would not wash because there was no justice who in 1996 would have voted to strike down DOMA. Indeed, as late as 2013, it seemed clear the court was not yet ready for marriage equality nationwide. Um, there's a wonderful line of Mae West's where she says, uh, marriage is a wonderful institution, but I'm not sure I'm ready for an institution yet. Uh, and I think the court was thinking that way. But times changed, and they t changed with tremendous uh, speed. As Justice Kennedy explained in Lawrence, the framers and ratifiers of the due process clauses of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments, which is where we get our claims of liberty under the Constitution, knew that times can blind us to certain truths, and later generations can see that laws once thought necessary and proper, in fact, serve only to oppress. As the Constitution endures, persons in every generation can invoke its principles in their own search for greater freedom. So what accounts then for the fact that in this generation, gay people have been more successful in the Supreme Court than people of color in their constitutional claims? Now, there, I could give you a very boring talk about legal doctrine, but I've decided not to do that. Instead, I want to look at somewhat more sociological explanations. So the first of these uh, goes to the difference between discrete formal barriers and exclusion on the one hand and systemic barriers to participation on the other. The director, John Waters, some of you may have seen his films, famously once remarked that he had always thought the privilege of being gay is that we don't have to get married or go into the army. Uh, and yet, the most striking things about the national victories of the gay rights movement during the Obama years are the arrival of marriage equality and the repeal of don't ask, don't tell. These victories share a number of characteristics. The first involves the fact that they were striking down formal, facially discriminatory legal barriers, and that the people who were bringing these claims sought access to fundamentally conservative institutions. Now, it might seem at first that there would be greater resistance precisely for that reason. But in another sense, I think these claims are actually less threatening to the existing order. Um, indeed, there was actually a division in the gay community about whether to go for marriage equality or not given that it seemed to be buying into an essentially conservative institution. As Justice Kennedy framed it in the conclusion of his decision in Obergefell, it would misunderstand these men and women to say they disrespect the idea of marriage, that is to suggest that they're radical. Their plea is that they do respect it, respect it so deeply that they seek to find, find its fulfillment for themselves. So one thing is that the marriage cases, as well as don't ask, don't tell, are asking for uh, a, a formal barrier to be struck down. Um, a second thing about these cases, marriage in particular, is that it involves uh, initially at least one big discrete interaction with the government. That is the issuance of a marriage license. To be sure, a, se a series of later consequences kind of flow from that decision. Um, but, and that was really the point of DOMA, which was to say, even if you've got a marriage license, all of these other things uh, don't happen. And, 
Uh, incidentally, one of the things that the Solicitor General began his uh, oral argument in the DOMA case with, and that we stressed as well, and so on the fly we had to change our argument a little bit because he had already mentioned this, is that one of the consequences of DOMA was that uh, soldiers who were killed in action, who were gay and who were married, could not have their belongings returned to their spouse nor could the spouse receive the flag at their funeral because the federal government was not treating them as married. And we thought that was a particularly powerful uh, example to give to the court of the, of, of the um, uh, consequences from DOMA. But the point is that all those consequences flowed almost automatically from that first initial decision. Uh, so it didn't require the government to make a series of individual decisions again and again and again. They simply knew that these people were or were not married. Um, and because it was one thing initially that was being asked from the government, although there were some hiccups of resistance, formal equality to marriage, act, marriage, formal access to marriage equality seems to have arrived relatively smoothly across most of the country. Now contrast that with what's going on in a lot of the race, racial justice cases. None of those cases really involve today what's known as de jure legal exclusion. That is a formal law that says something like what's being said here, which is uh, white officers go to one shower and black officers go to another shower. Broadly speaking, the kinds of exclusion that people of color face today uh, involve three kinds of practices. They don't involve the formal practices uh, that, uh, as, as a matter of express law, deny people uh, in, in benefits or impose burdens. As far as I know, the last two examples of formal racial exclusion uh, inside the United States, and we can talk in the question and answer period about uh, exclusion of people from the United States or the like, uh, but the last two examples of this kind of general practice uh, involved uh, the Virginia prohibition on interracial marriage that was struck down uh, in uh, 1967 in Loving Against Virginia, uh, now a major motion picture. Uh, and a California state prison policy of using race in temporary room assignments for inmates that was struck down by the Supreme Court in 2005. So let me talk about the other two forms of exclusion. These arrive, uh, either, arise either from disparate treatment or from disparate impact. Disparate treatment is when a formally neutral law is used in a purposefully racially discriminatory way. Uh, and it's, uh, can be difficult to it can be difficult to prove, and it often requires individuals bringing lawsuits one after the next to show that they personally were subjected to discriminatory treatment, intentionally discriminatory treatment, in the application of a law that on its face looks perfectly fair. Moreover, because this involves administration of what looks like a fair law, there are numerous opportunities for government officials to engage in kind of covert racial discrimination that can be hard to ferret out. It's therefore harder for courts to police this form of exclusion than to police a form of exclusion that simply says, give everybody a marriage license. The second uh, form that I want to talk about is disparate impact. And these are uh, photographs. This photograph was taken during the 1965 march in Selma to Montgomery. And this is a photograph I took uh, down in Selma uh, when I went down for the 50th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery march. And one of the things you can see from this is what I'm going to point to now is that disparate treatment claims implicate a much more complex web of circumstances than, dis than formal exclusion claims. The disparate impact of a law, that is that a law that's fair on its face has a differential effect on people of color uh, and of white people, uh, often is tied to intergenerational effects, many of them tied in turn to persistent but now long past de jure discrimination. So unwinding that impact, which often has a lot to do with socioeconomic disadvantage that's been transferred down from generation to generation, uh, lies beyond the largely prohibitory injunctions that are very easy for courts to issue. It requires structural reform litigation or the creation of affirmative entitlements. So if you want to deal with a law, for example, that requires you to have a university degree to enter into a particular profession, it may be that a much higher percentage of whites than people of color have university degrees, but it's not because there's formal discrimination today. It's because 
socioeconomically, you're far more likely to be in the lowest socioeconomic decile if you're African American than if you're white, and therefore much more likely not to have the opportunities uh, that go to more affluent folks. Now compare that to what happens with, with um, uh, gay people. Intergenerational wealth transfer and transmission of disadvantage uh, likely plays only a tangential role with regard to LGBT people because gay parents are not more likely than straight parents to have gay children. And gay children are not more likely than straight children to have gay parents. So there's very little intergenerational transmission of disadvantage here. And what little intergenerational effect there is seems to mostly be the product of straight parents who reject their gay children, which is why you find a much higher percentage of runaways uh, and kids in foster care who are gay than who are straight. Um, but that's a relative, even that's a relatively small uh, scale, um, both with regard to how many people it affects and with regard to what percentage of the population it affects. There may be cases somewhere down the road where LGBT individuals raise disparate impact claims. But disparate impact theory seems at least, far, at least now far less central to the claims of the current gay rights anti-discrimination project than it has necessarily become in the struggle for racial justice. In short, uh, gay rights claims and racial justice claims are at different points in the life cycle of the struggle for legal equality. Gay people are still dealing with formal discrimination and exclusion, whereas people of color are mostly dealing with more intractable, deeper, more systemic problems. Let me turn now to a second uh, example. The second distinction between contemporary gay rights claims and contemporary racial justice claims stems from the nature of the benefits that people are seeking. Marriage licenses, for example, not only involve a relatively simple, discrete formal act, getting the license from the government, but they are what are called non-rivalrous and non-positional goods. And I'll get to what that means in a moment. By contrast, many of the entitlements that are at the heart of the Supreme Court's racial justice cases involve scarce opportunities. So let me talk first about the marriage cases. Now, in jurisdictions like every jurisdiction in the United States that has a law against bigamy or polygamy, any individual marriage could be characterized as a rivalrous good. That is, a good whose consumption by one person necessarily means it can't be consumed by someone else. So if I'm married to somebody, you can't marry me. Or at least you can't marry me until I get rid of my prior spouse. Right? Um, so that means uh, any one marriage is a rival good. Uh, but that's really totally unimportant on the societal level. That is, there's no limit to the number of marriages a jurisdiction can solemnize. That is, my getting married doesn't prevent you from getting married in some way. It's not like a parking space. Right? If I park there, you can't park there. Marriage is not a parking space. That sounds like something it should be like on your refrigerator on a magnet, I know. Um, at the same time, particular marriages might, at least for the status conscious or the insecure or the envious among us, be viewed as positional goods. That is, goods whose value depends strongly on how they compare with others. Um, no doubt some people treat marriage as positional in the sense that they consider being married better than being anything else. Um, but there's no reason to think that a significant number of people who are married in America today value their own marriages in substantial part because there are other individuals who can't get married. Right? That is, there aren't a lot of people who say the reason it, my marriage is worthwhile is because other people can't get it. Um, as opposed to the goods I'm going to turn to uh, in a moment. Now, you know, to be sure, there are some opponents of marriage equality who argue that extending the right to marry to same-sex couples would deprive opposite-sex couples of something meaningful. Uh, but that argument got relatively tra little traction, in part because it's incredibly ridiculous. And I'll just summarize how the New York courts came to that argument, and you'll see why I think it's a really bad argument. So the New York Court of Appeals upheld the state's uh, ma marriage ban uh, which was ultimately overturned by legislation, but upheld that ban ab about 10 years ago on the grounds that the reason we have marriage is to make sure that feckless straight men will be responsible for their children and 
The problem you have is that people will get accidentally pregnant, and if they're not already married to each other, they're not going to take care of the kids. Right? So it was, a, it was an argument about why straight men are bad. Now, if you were to ask historically why was marriage restricted to same-sex couples, it was an argument that gay people were distinctively unworthy. But the New York court said, oh, no, 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 that's an impermissible argument now. We can't make an argument like that. That's discriminatory. But here's the thing. Straight people get pregnant by accident. Gay people seldom do. <laughs> Therefore, we don't have to worry about gay couples taking care of their children. Now, just to lay that argument out, is to, is to kind of reveal something very strange about that argument. Because the other thing is, it's not whether the people are married at the time the fetus, uh, the embryo is implanted. It's a question about whether they stay married through thick and thin. And there's no reason to think that the accidental purposeful nature of the, act, of the conception itself is the major determinant of whether both parents will take responsibility for the child until the child turns 18. So it's not a great argument, right? It's not a great argument to say marriage is a positional good and somehow the marriage of straight people is diluted by the ability of gay people to get married. You may have seen the bumper sticker that says, don't believe in gay marriage, don't get married to someone who's gay, right? <laughs> that, that, that kind of argument um, seemed to have a lot of traction. So nobody really makes the argument anymore that that's what's going on. Now, contrast that, that way of thinking about marriage as a non-rivalrous, non-positional good with the goods that were at issue in recent Supreme Court racial justice cases. Consider, for example, the seats in selective university entering classes, the issue in Fisher against University of Texas, or Schutte against Coalition to Defend Affirmative Action by All Means Necessary. Or consider the attractive public sector jobs at issue in the fire department in New Haven in Ricci against DiStefano. Or consider the affordable housing at issue in Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs against Inclusive Communities Project. Each of these is a case about a good that is a rivalrous good. If I have a seat in the entering class, you can't have it. If I get to be a captain in the New Haven de Fire Department after taking the test, you don't get that. If I get the good, limited public housing that there is, you can't get it. And when it comes to selective educational institutions, remember, it's not just a rivalrous good. It's a positional good. Part of the value is the very scarcity of the good. That is, if everybody could get into Dartmouth, it's not just that the education would suffer. Some of the value of a Dartmouth education would be less because it would be less elite and less selective. Now, the voting rights cases raise this in a really kind of interesting way, which is a voting case like Shelby County, um, you know, the question is, is voting a rivalrous good or is it a positional good? And the answer here is it's a little bit of both. That is, the right simply to participate in an election shouldn't be treated as a rivalrous good. The fact that I can cast a ballot doesn't prevent you from casting a ballot. But when you get to the question of what are elections intended to produce, that is, winners and losers, there is a competition. They are positional goods. And thus, because votes are the currency that produces electoral success, the ability to participate has come to be treated uh, particularly by the Republican Party in large parts of the country as a zero-sum game in which, to quote uh, an opinion from the Fourth Circuit in a, new, in a North Carolina case I worked on, um, restrictive laws are used to target African Americans with almost surgical precision to eliminate them from the electorate because, uh, and this is a real irony that some of you may find uh, interesting, African-American race is a better predictor of whether somebody will vote as a Democrat than whether the person is registered as a Democrat in North Carolina. Right? So if you're trying to target Democrats because you want to win as a Republican, you're better off targeting black voters than targeting registered Democrats. Because an independent who's African-American is more likely to vote Democratic uh, than uh, necessarily a white person who's registered as a Democrat. So here's the thing. By their nature, cases that involve rival goods are likely harder to win in court. And not just because they're going to be a motivated op opposing party on the other side, 
but because these cases involve countervailing compelling stories by people on both sides. That is, in the Fisher case, there's a claim for affirmative action to, re to resolve Texas's long history of excluding African Americans and Latinos from the state university. But there's also Abigail Fisher, the girl who says, I'm not responsible for any of that. Why shouldn't I have the same chance to go uh, to the University of Texas that an African American or a Latino student has? So one way to think about this is to recognize that the next phase of gay rights litigation may prove more challenging precisely because it may implicate competing claims of rights. The marriage equality cases, for example, sought only to compel the government to grant official recognition to marriage-based claims that involve access to government-provided benefits. By contrast, public accommodations lawsuits against photographers or caterers who refuse to provide services to same-sex couples involve a clash between gay individuals' right to equality and non-discrimination and other private individuals' claims of autonomy or conscience or religious obligation. It may well be at the end of the day that the courts resolve these claims the same way they resolve parallel claims involving race discrimination in the 1960s, which is in favor of non-discrimination rather than in favor of religious claims. But it's not entirely clear that they will. Uh, and it's worth remembering that the Supreme Court that ruled in favor of marriage equality in Windsor and in Obergfell and in favor of non-discrimination in Christian Legal Society against Martinez, a case about how the University of California gave access to different student groups, also ruled against gay, gay claimants in the Boston St. Patrick's Day Parade case and in the Boy Scouts against Dale case. This is yet another way in which the differential success of gay rights and racial justice claims may in fact be part of the difference in the life cycle of the struggle that the two groups find themselves in. Now let me turn to a final explanation. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, Bruce Ackerman, who's a professor of law at Yale, published a foundational article called Beyond Caroline Products that's about a case called uh, Car United States Against Caroline Products, which involves a truly disgusting, disgusting thing, something called mill knot, which is filled milk. What they do is they take the milk solids out and they pump in like coconut oil or something and they sell it as milk. And there was a federal law that uh, regulated the use of this kind of filled milk. And the case went up to the Supreme Court and the question was, could Congress regulate this? And the Supreme Court uh, held that they could regulate it and there's a footnote in the opinion. For those of you who distrust lawyers, in a way, all the good stuff can be in the footnotes. So there was a famous footnote in this opinion. It's called footnote four. It's the most famous footnote in all of American law. Uh, and footnote four says, essentially, generally the courts will defer to the government when the government says, we have, we've got a good reason for this. And if the courts can come up with any reason at all that seems rationally related, that's going to be OK. But the footnote says there are three kinds of laws where we're going to be very suspicious. The first kind of law is where the Constitution itself, like right in the text, says you can't do this. The second kind of law is a law that restricts political processes. In other words, that kind of keeps the people who are in power in and locks up the system, because we're supposed to have a democratic system. So for example, the First Amendment is an important example of this. Voting is an important example. So the courts will scrutinize laws that restrict voting uh, more closely than laws that restrict mill not. And then this is the part of the footnote that I want to focus on, which is there can be prejudice against discrete and insular minorities that tend seriously to curtail the processes that you usually should rely on, and therefore calls for correspondingly more searching judicial inquiry. In other words, when you've got a discrete and insular minority group, the courts need to protect them more because they can't protect themselves as fully in the political process. This is where the Supreme Court has located, for example, the importance of looking especially closely at laws that discriminate on the basis of race and looking closely at laws that discriminate on the basis of sex. So in his article, um, Professor Ackerman challenged the idea that discrete and insular minorities were the most likely groups to be discriminated against. He thought that being discrete and insular, by which he meant being a group where you all knew each other and you were concentrated geographically, 
might make you more powerful than other minority groups because you could be a majority in a particular district, because you'd know each other, so the costs of organizing would be lower, and because people couldn't get out of the group by just pretending not to be part of the group. And so he suggested that rather than thinking of race as the most disadvantaged group, uh, we might think of the victims of sexual orientation discrimination or poverty rather than religious or racial groups as being the ones with the greatest claim on Caroline's co concern with the fairness of the process. But while Professor Ackerman has turned out to be spot on about some of the difficulties poor people face, uh, he may have turned out to be wrong about the relative position of gay people and racial minorities. And this, ironically, may be precisely because gay individuals are less insular, not more insular, than people of color. 30 years on, after Bruce Ackerman's article, which was written in the 1980s and influenced very much my own scholarship, uh, gay people are no longer invisible. They have come out, even at the Supreme Court. So in 1985, during the conference, I'm sorry, in 1986, during the conference discussing Bowers against Hardwick, which was a case where the Supreme Court upheld a Georgia law that made it a 20-year felony uh, for gay people to have sex, uh, the, uh, the deciding justice in a five to four decision, Justice Lewis Powell told his colleagues, quite mistakenly, by the way, at uh, the conference where it's just the nine of the justices in the room, that he had never met anyone who was gay. In 2003, the counsel who successfully argued to have Bowers against Hardwick overturned in the Lawrence against Texas case was a man named Paul Smith, an experienced Supreme Court advocate, a former law clerk to Justice Powell, and an openly gay man. I was in the courtroom that day, and after the argument, which had gone very well for our side, I was standing with Walter Dellinger, who is a leading uh, Supreme Court advocate uh, and a constitutional law professor and an acting solicitor general from the uh, Clinton administration. And um, we were just standing around in the, in the courtroom, and uh, Linda Greenhouse, who was then the New York Times uh, Supreme Court correspondent, came over to us. And Walter asked Linda what she thought was the most interesting part of the argument. And without missing a beat, without missing a beat, Linda replied, the bar section of the Supreme Court. What she meant by that is that those seats, the seats right up close to the justices, some of the seats that needed $6,000 worth of paid line standing time a couple of years later, were filled in significant parts by former clerks and other frequent participants before the court who were openly gay. When the justices came out from behind the velvet curtain to take their seats, it was clear that at least some of them recognized this fact. You could kind of see Justice O'Connor and she was going like. As she went down the row of lawyers and I said, yeah, Walter, when she got to you, she was very surprised. And Walter, who's very straight and very married, said, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm faithful, I'm faithful. Um, but the justices could see lots of gay people that they knew. And to paraphrase uh, former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, in the 17 years between Bowers against Hardwick and Lawrence against Texas, gay people had moved from being unknown unknowns to being known unknowns to being known knowns. The justices had always known people who were gay, but now they knew it. These were people who had worked for them, people they respected, people who had in some cases become uh, virtually a part of their families. Two decades of gay people coming out meant that the justices, like the rest of the American people, now understood that gay people were their children, their friends, their colleagues, their employees. And it may be precisely because gay people are in one very important way not insular that they've been successful in the struggle for marriage equality. The vast majority of gay children are born to straight parents. As a result, many straight people have intimate family ties to gay people, and those ties can be powerful levers for changing attitudes. On the eve of the arguments in Perry against Windsor, for example, an alumnus of this school, Senator Rob Portman, a longtime opponent of same-sex marriage, announced a change of heart on the question of marriage equality. And he attributed that change to learning that one of his sons was gay and wanting him, I'm here I'm going to quote him, to have the same opportunities that his brother and sister would have. By contrast, it is hard to imagine the politician who wakes up to discover that his children are African American or poor 
or undocumented. The continued residential and socioeconomic isolation of minority communities means that their claims are less likely to resonate deeply and personally with decision makers. The intimate connection that gay people have with the majority community thus not only changes the sorts of legal claims they're likely to bring, but also, I think, increases their chances of success in bringing them. The juxtaposition of claims of gay equality and racial justice that struck me as I stood in that line in April of 2015 came back to me with special force two months later. On June 26, 2015, the Supreme Court held in favor of marriage equality and the White House took on the rainbow colors of the gay pride movement. And I was lucky enough to be there that day for something um, not particularly connected with the White House turning different colors, but around six o'clock uh, the, in the meeting I was in, um, Valerie Jarrett came in and said, you all need to stay and come down to the portico. And when we got down there, there was just like these little tiny like purple dot on the edge of the White House. And as you stayed there over the night, it got darker and darker and darker, and the lights all lit up. They put gels on all the lights so that you got this rainbow uh, effect on the White House. Um, it was, in a sense, a day like no other. But that same June 26, 2015, was also the day that President Obama went to Charleston, South Carolina to speak at the funerals of the nine Americans who were murdered as they prayed at Emanuel AME Church. And I was struck by how purple that scene was as well. And today, we live in a nation where the same president who announces that he is fine with marriage equality because the issue has been settled by the Supreme Court has nominated an attorney general who first came to national attention for his role in racially selective prosecutions of black voting rights activists in Alabama and who will be responsible for defending this country's voting laws going forward. That we have moved so far is sometimes cause for celebration and sometimes cause for despair. Thank you very much. So I'm, I'm glad to take questions if anybody has questions, or since I'm a law school professor, I'm glad to just cold call on people in the audience and ask them <laughs> questions myself. Yeah. Questions? Yes, sir. What's the prospect of the gay lesbian community under the present governmental administration? What's the prospect of the, the prospects of them retaining their rights and privileges? So some of the rights and privileges, I think, it's quite likely they'll retain, and then some are in sub substantial jeopardy. So a couple of things that I think there's not much this administration could do about it, even if it wanted to. I don't think that they can overturn Obergefell and Windsor. Uh, for one thing, they don't have the votes on the Supreme Court, and you need the Supreme Court to overturn that decision. Uh, even if Judge Gorsuch were to be uh, confirmed and, was, and were to have the same views on this as Justice Scalia, it was a 5-4 decision the other way. So uh, it just replaces one justice who didn't believe in marriage equality with another. The other thing about that is marriage equality is really a fact on the ground. Uh, and so unwinding marriages of people who already have them is a much more difficult thing to do than to deny somebody the right to get married in the first place because the confusion that would come out of that is, is great. Moreover, that's an issue on which I think the ship has sailed. That is, the American people are not generally, or even in substantial numbers, upset with marriage equality. And it's a, it was a generational issue in some ways, as it turned out when you looked at the polling. For example, among uh, white Protestant evangelicals under the age of 30, which is one of the most culturally conservative groups in the country, they were split 50-50 three years ago about whether marriage equality was a good or bad thing. And you know. Every other group was more in favor of marriage equality uh, than they were. So it's a generational. I think the gender identity issue, which is up at the Supreme Court right now in the Gloucester County against GG case, may well be in trouble. Because part of the reason why the courts below, so the GG case involves a, a transgender boy uh, who's going to school in Gloucester County, Virginia. He wanted to use the boy's bathroom and the schools barred him from the boys' bathroom, and he brought a lawsuit. Uh, and uh, at the stages where this case was in the district court and in the court of appeals, the federal government supported him because of the change in 
how the Justice Department and the Department of Education interpret because of sex. So they say because of sex means because of sex, gender identity, and the like. That, I think, is in trouble because I think the administration is likely to change its view on that in the Supreme Court. And we won't know for another couple of weeks because they've been given an extension of the briefing schedule. The Supreme Court extended the briefing schedule. So we'll see when that comes in. Whether courts would reach this conclusion on their own rather than by deferring to the agency, we don't know. The EEOC has taken the position that uh, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation is forbidden by Title VII, which is a civil rights statute that's been around since 1964. Unclear whether that will still be the position of the federal government going forward. There have been discussions about whether the federal government will come out with a uh, a conscience, interp so-called conscience interpretation of federal law. There's a draft executive order that's been floating around that would say, well, the federal government itself won't discriminate against married couples on the basis of their sexual orientation. It will allow all fun federal funds recipients and all federal government employees who themselves have a religiously based objection to same-sex marriage, not to have to participate in providing any services, which can create both kind of weird log jams and also, of course, deny people dignity. Because if you show up, you're a soldier, a gay soldier who's married, and you show up at the VA and you say, uh, I and my spouse want treatment, and they say, sorry, we don't think you're really married. The fact that they then bring in somebody else to say, okay, I'll treat you, doesn't deny you, doesn't grant you the dignity that every other couple has received. So I think you know, not horrible right now, but not good, right? There'll be some things this, the government won't touch, and there'll be other things that'll become really quite problematic. Will people be more inclined? Will people be more inclined to bring suits to the Supreme Court, given the disbalance in the Supreme Court? Possible? So, so one of the, the hard things, right, is knowing when you start a lawsuit, you don't know what the Supreme Court's going to look like when you get there, right? And so the question whether you want to try and bring a lawsuit right now to nail something down, or whether you're worried that if you bring a lawsuit now, the composition of the court will change further. You know, people have to make kind of strategic decisions about that. Much of what goes on, though, is not straight up Supreme Court litigation. Um, on these issues, that is, if you look at the marriage equality movement, they didn't start by going to the Supreme Court. They started by doing things in state courts, in states with uh, judiciary that they thought would be favorable to them. So the, you know, the Vermont case was the first of those cases. Obviously, the Massachusetts case, uh, California cases, and the like. So I would start. I would predict that what you will see is, at least in the short run, great variation in the kinds of protection that gay people have depending on where they live in the country. Because there are going to be states that have you know, vigorous anti-discrimination law and big commitment. And then you have a state like Mississippi, you know, which still has not really cottoned to the fact they lost the Civil War. Um, and they have a conscience law that's under challenge now in the Fifth, in the fifth Circuit, which is the appellate court that over, federal appellate court that oversees Mississippi because they have a law that a district court judge found violated the Establishment Clause because it so uh, privileges certain religious beliefs about marriage over it, all other religious beliefs. Um, so it, it's going to vary. Right? I mean, this is one of these things. Um, the first time I really got paid for anything I said as a lawyer, except by my employer, was um, I gave a graduation speech at Virginia. This was in 1993 when I was on the faculty there, in which I said, you know, before you came to law school, if somebody in your family asked you a legal question, you didn't know the answer. And now you've been here, and $30,000 later, which shows you just how long ago this was, three years and $30,000 later, you can say with tremendous assurance, it depends. <laughs> and one of the parents sent this to Reader's Digest, so it made it into campus comedy. Um, and that was like the first time anybody had sent me a check for anything I said. So. I was grateful to Reader's Digest for that. But it depends where you are in the country. That is, people in New England, people in, in, in blue states generally, are going to be protected by state laws. But there are a bunch of states now in the United States where you're protected if you get married, but you can be fired from your job the next day because you're gay, because there's no prohibition 
on discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. So there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot, lot, lot going on. What, is that at the state or federal level? There's no federal law that expressly says you can't, if you're a private company, discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation and employment. The EEOC, which is the federal agency that's responsible for interpreting Title VII, has said they interpret because of sex to include because of sexual orientation. But that's not a nationwide um, holding by a court. So, you know, the Fortune 500 companies all have non-discrimination policies on sexual orientation as far as I know. But there are a lot of smaller businesses that don't. Yeah, I think you've got a mic coming to Yeah, thanks for a, a really interesting talk. Um, and I actually want to sort of push further on a point you just raised about the support structures for uh, legal mobilization and ultimately political change. Yeah. Um, and the success of uh, sort of gay rights movement and litigation and um, the failure or just less success in, in the racial justice arena. And so uh, part of your claim, which I found really really persuasive was that A, uh, things are just easier in the area of gay rights, and B, and you didn't put it exactly this way, but I, I think this is implicit, uh, B, the sort of white liberal elites uh, know more gay people than they know people of color. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if there was sort of a, an implicit or a suppressed critique of, of white liberal elites who would have to provide these support structures uh, on both fronts for sort of succumbing to both of the challenges that you've, uh, I think, accurately described. So I don't know how much it's white liberal elites versus white people generally, whether elite or non-elite, whether conservative or liberal. Um, I think some of it is, it's not exactly compassion fatigue, but it's a sense that some of these issues are just much less tractable. That is, you know, if you're talking about things like, why is it that you know, 50 years after the beginning of the second reconstruction, we still have uh, a lot of difference in socioeconomic status. And one of the things that's most striking is if you look at the difference between income and wealth. So for example, if you take two people, one of whom is white and one of whom is black, and they're both earning exactly the same amount of money, and you look at what's their household wealth, the household wealth is hugely different. That is, middle class black people often have virtually no wealth. Why is that? Because in part, they all had to take out student loans to get through college in a way with no help from their parents, no economic help from their parents. They live in neighborhoods where the housing values are less valuable and for a huge amount of Americans, a major source of their wealth is their home ownership. Um, and these things are not, e it's not easy to figure out exactly how you fix these. Um, and if you do fix it, it's expensive and it involves redistribution. And so all of that combines. I don't think it's mostly about progressives are the people who are stopping this and otherwise it would happen. I think it's more, more widespread than that. Um, that is, even if as a progressive you would believe, as I do, that I should be paying higher taxes and that those taxes should be going to social services and we should ramp up Head Start and we should ramp up the quality of schools that are provided in urban areas and we should have more affirmative action and the like, it's hard to persuade lots of people to do all of that, right? Especially, especially when you've got leaders who are, you know, to my mind, kind of using that as a wedge issue. Um, and so in that sense, if you look historically at the United States, what we're seeing now is very similar to some of the stuff you saw at the end of the first reconstruction, which is the attempt uh, by a kind of form of racist populism to pit working people against each other in a variety of ways um, and to deregulate the economy in a kind of new gilded age in a variety of ways. And that stuff is not particularly about liberals versus conservatives. So I'm not, I, I, I don't think that if every white liberal was more committed to this project that that would necessarily create a majority in favor of the project nationwide. Yeah? But populism yeah. appears to me to be a white movement and not a black movement. So how are blacks going to benefit? 
So they're not, that, that's what I mean by saying this looks a little bit like some of the stuff that you saw at the end, at, towards the end of the, the first reconstruction, which was, there was an attempt in the South in the 1880s and 1890s to really build a populist movement that was going to be poor whites and poor blacks pushing back against the extractive industry companies like forestry and like pushing back against the mills that were there and arguing for a kind of more, you know, more egalitarian system. And that was destroyed in part by race baiting. So the rich whites in the South, the so-called Bourbons, um, would say to white people in the South, look, maybe you're poor, and everything, but at least you're not black. And it was a way of driving the economic interests and the, and, and the kind of more general egalitarian interests of the two groups apart. And that's what I mean. It's not, that, it's not that the current populism is really appealing directly or trying to appeal directly to blacks, but some of it is this suggestion that the reason that your, that your factory job went away in Ohio is because of immigrants uh, and because of undeserving people not like you in an important way. And that's what I mean by the kind of wedge issue. Does that, does that help? So it's not, it's a, that's what, it's, it's a different form, there are two different kinds of populism. There's a populism that actually tries to build bridges across groups that are divided by religion or divided by race or divided by geography. And then there's another one which tries to exploit those differences. Um, largely, I think, to keep the existing distribution of power. Yes? Oh. Um, at the risk of being uh, a smart ass, I have to make the observation that we don't have anybody who's gay on the Supreme Court, but we clearly have one person who's African American. No impact? So I, I, think, I think he has actually had an important impact on the court, which is he is opposed to most of the legislation of a lot of legislation of the second reconstruction. And that validates people's view that it's okay to be against affirmative action because Clarence Thomas, Justice Clarence Thomas says, affirmative action is terrible for black people. And so you can feel okay about being against affirmative action because here is this major national spokesman saying affirmative action is a terrible thing. Or uh, Justice Thomas, for example, saying that he thinks disparate impact theory is a terrible thing and might be unconstitutional. Because it take, it's too race conscious to say you can't have practices that have a disparate impact. Um, so, and I don't think it's like, do you know one black person that influences you? I think it's like, do you have, do you know lots of people who are members of a particular group? And do you have a sense of what the overall perspective of the group is. That is, Justice Thomas's views on racial justice are somewhat different than probably the modal view uh, in the African American community generally. Is that, is that, does that respond to you good? So, I mean, yeah, they all know that Clarence Thomas is black. And they don't know whether any of their colleagues are gay or not. Um, but they, but the number of clerks that they have, for example, who's gay, vastly exceeds the number of African American clerks at the Supreme Court over time, in part because of the socioeconomic disadvantages that also mean, you know, there are lots of rich, white, gay kids who go to fancy law schools and do super well and then get clerkships. Yes, sir. Do you think, um, do you think that a majority of the court, or the majority of the court that was in the majority in Shelby County, uh, would say that uh, racial discrimination motivated by partisanship, so using race as a proxy for Democrats, um, is not discrimination that we ought to worry about in the same way as, as other types of racial discrimination from the past. And uh, you know, that sort of leads into a broader question is, do you think anyone in the majority from Shelby County um, ha you know, and we're, this, this is a calls for psychoanalysis of the court, but um, might be shocked at what's happened since Shelby County was decided and some of the legislative behavior we've seen. Yeah, so, so let me answer the second question and then go back to the, to the first one. So the second question is, I think maybe 
Justice Kennedy might be surprised about it. But there's no reason why anybody on court should have been surprised about it. That is, the, uh, the points that um, were made by the people who were defending the law, and I represented the, I know this is going to sound like a weird phrase to you all, but the bipartisan leadership of the House Judiciary Committee. So my clients were the chairman, the ranking member, the, and, and the next two people down, and the chairman of the subcommittee. And they flipped from Republican to Democrat between the 2009 version of the case and the 2013 version. And both times I filed a brief for them. So one time it was Jim Sensenbrenner and the people below him, the other time it was John Connors. So we told them this was going to happen. That is, this was not one of those things where, oh my god, who could have guessed? Because there was still, if, you know, up until the day Shelby County was decided, this stuff was going on. The Texas voter ID bill that I spent a lot of my time at DOJ suing over once I got there was exact, had already been passed before Shelby County. It had just been blocked by the Department of Justice. Um, so it was not like none of this stuff was happening and then, oh my God, you know, it's not like, it's not like sometimes, you know, you cut yourself and you hold, you hold it and 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 you figure by now it's clotted and you take your hand off and boom. That's not what this was like at all. That is, anybody could predict it. But I think maybe in like his, you know, Justice Kennedy has a very sunny, optimistic view of a lot of stuff. Maybe he was surprised. But if he was, it was not because it, it was not. Your first question raises this really difficult issue in equal protection law, which is the Supreme Court long ago, oh my god, I just saw a huge piece of chewing gum on the bottom of that chair. I'm just going to it. It smells minty, so it might be fairly recent. Um, the, um, the Supreme Court long ago said when you're trying to show whether something's racially, dis purposefully discriminatory or not, something that's not on its face discriminatory, you have to show that the legislature that adopted it or the government that adopted it adopted it because of and not in spite of its racial content. And they did this in a case that actually wasn't about race, it was about sex, where Massachusetts had a lifetime absolute preference for veterans in civil service. But if you were a veteran you, and you passed a test for any job in civil service, you automatically went to the top of the list. So if you got like a, if, let's say passing is a 60. You got a 61, you would go ahead of somebody who got a 99 who wasn't a veteran. And the result of this, this was in the 1970s, so you can predict what the result of this was. No women ever got top jobs in the Massachusetts civil service. And they sued and they said, this is sex discrimination. Massachusetts said, yeah, yeah, we know, we know that it has that effect, but that's not why we do it. We do it to help the veterans. The Supreme Court said, okay, that's why you're doing it. The fact that you knew it and you did it anyway, not discriminatory because it's dis despite, not because of. Okay, now you can see where I'm about to go with this, which is when you have partisan motivations and racial motivations, how do you disentangle them if partisan motivations are okay and racial motivations aren't. Now, I personally think, when it comes to the actual right to vote itself, partisan motivations aren't okay. That is, you can't deny somebody the right to vote because they're going to be a Democrat or because they're a Republican. So it doesn't matter there. But when you get to things like districting, where partisanship can be taken into account, it becomes really difficult to disentangle these two things. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the Voting Rights Act, for example, uh, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which is still around, doesn't ask that question about intent. Because Congress said in 1982, that's asking the wrong question. The question should be, what's the effect? So my hope is that the Supreme Court will apply the Voting Rights Act to deal with that, so they don't have to disentangle the partisanship and the, and, and the racial motivations. Because it's really hard to do that in places where you have a black party and a white party, which is, in parts of the South, you know, 14% of white voters are voting for the white can, are, are voting for the Democratic candidate. And 99% of the black voters are voting for the Democratic candidate. 86% of the white voters are voting for the Republican candidate. And 1% of the black voters are voting for the Republican candidate. Are the, is that a racial divide or is that a political divide? You, know, you can't even do regressions on this if you want to be, you know, if you, because whichever thing you regress on first is going to explain most of the variance. Is that, is that yes, the question? Anybody else? Yeah. Since you were heading in that direction anyway, um, do you, you think, well, yeah, that too. Um, do you think that the court will ever 
reevaluate their position about uh, partisan gerrymandering? Yeah, so the court has a case that, the court has the ca a case that's right now about to go up to them on this. Um, so here's the thing about partisan gerrymandering. Um, all districting is gerrymandering in one sense. That is, it's intended to have different effects than if you just elected everybody at large. Um, and in 2003, all nine of the justices agreed that partisan gerrymandering can violate the Constitution. Um, in a case called Beef against Jubilee, that involved uh, the way that um, Pennsylvania drew its congressional districts. You know, Pennsylvania is a swing state, and they managed to draw it so the Republicans would get like two thirds of the districts. Um, and so all nine of the justices agreed there was something problematic. But, and here's the big but, four of the justices, led by Justice Scalia, said, yeah, it might be a constitutional problem, but as a court, we can't fix it. That's what's a, they called it what's known as a political question, which means a question that the political branches, Congress and the president, should fix. And so they recognized it was a problem, but they said, we can't fix it. And the reason we can't fix it is we can't come up with what's called a judicially manageable standard. That is, some standard that it's easy for courts to apply. Like one person, one vote is a great judicially manageable standard because it's what Justice um, uh, Stewart called sixth grade arithmetic. Right? You just have to divide and you know whether you've met it or not. But the problem with partisan gerrymandering is some amount of taking into account election results is okay. It's just when is it too much? And that, so four justices said, we can't come up with a standard, so um, not for courts to decide. Four justices said, oh, there are obviously manageable standards, but they divided three ways about what those standards are. And then one justice, Justice Kennedy, said, you know, here's the thing. I don't want to say there's no judicially manageable standard. On the other hand, I haven't seen a standard. But I'm hoping somebody can tell me whether there's a standard. So never say never. So people since then, for the last like 15 years, have been trying to come up with a standard that we think Justice Kennedy would like, right, is what the different groups are trying to do. And there's a case that was just decided by a three-judge federal court in Wisconsin that held that Wisconsin state legislative redistricting was an excessive partisan gerrymander. And they used a set of, um, they, they used a set of rules that were developed by um, a law professor and a political scientist that go to this, the concept of vote wastage. And the idea behind vote wastage is if you win a district by more than, I'm gonna use very simple numbers here. Let's say you have 100 people in the district. If you win the district 51, 49, the 51, there are no wasted votes for the winning side. The 49 people who voted the other way, their votes are wasted because they didn't elect anybody. Now, imagine a district that votes 99 in favor, and 99 for candidate A and one for candidate B. The one for candidate B is wasted. And 44, am I doing this? Can I just use, because I d hate doing this kind of thing in myself. Hey. Forty-six of the votes. Did I do that? No. no God, that's why. You see, forty-eight of the votes for the winning side are wasted. Ninety-seven wasted. It only took two to win. No, you need to. You need oh, to. In other words, you need fifty-one votes to win the district. Because I'm assuming yeah. everybody's voting, right? Yeah. So you need fifty-one votes to win. So in a district that's ninety-nine to one, this one is wasted. These forty-eight are wasted. That is, any vote that doesn't go to a winning candidate is wasted, and any vote that's more than what somebody needs to win is wasted. Everybody with me? More or less? Okay. So what these two guys, Nick Stephanopoulos is, is, is one of the two, what they've done is they've said, you look at how many votes are wasted for Democratic candidates and how many votes are wasted for Republican candidates. And if there's a huge disproportion between that, that is, many more Democratic votes are being wasted than Republican votes being wasted, that suggests the Republicans have gerrymandered too much. And he's come up with a number, and he says if you're more than, I, think, I can't remember the number offhand, but more than X amount difference in the percentage of wasted votes statewide, that's enough. Now this has the virtue of being something you can do easily as a matter of math. It has some complications to it, which is you're looking at elections 
using the existing districting system. So that may increase or decrease turnout in various complicated ways that lead to more votes being wasted for one side than the other, not because the parties drew it that way, but just because candidates for one side are more popular or the like. And the other problem is that if you just look at numbers like this, and then the question is, what should the districts look like? There is an inherent biasing effect given contemporary American politics in favor of the Republican Party. That is, even before the districts are drawn, because Democrats are more geographically concentrated. And so it's highly more likely that you'll end up with districts that are overwhelmingly Democratic than that are overwhelmingly Republican if you draw anything that looks like a natural district. But this case, a majority Republican court, that is, a majority of the judges on the three-judge court in, in um, in uh, Wisconsin where Republican appointees found that the Republicans had gerrymandered too much. So it will be interesting to see when this case goes up to the Supreme Court, which will be soon, uh, what happens. Um, you know, it depends, it depends. Okay, well I think I've answered, oh, last question. Okay. Can you give us your analysis of the wedding cake baker cases and the, um, the yeah, wedding the, photographer cases. Yeah, so the, the wedding cake baker cases and the wedding cake photographer cases are cases, all of these are cases that are brought under state public accommodations laws. So these are states that say, um, if you are a business open to the public, here are bases on which you can't discriminate. So usually it's like race, almost always. Uh, sometimes it'll be religion. Sometimes it'll be sex, but not for every business. Um, so for example, the federal public accommodation statute, which doesn't cover sexual orientation, does cover race, but it doesn't cover sex. Uh, so different states have different rules on this, but these cases have come from states that include sexual orientation in their list of reasons you can't discriminate against somebody. So if you're a business open to the public, you've gotta be open to all comers uh, who can pay the fee. The arguments on the other side, it's really interesting. So in the photographer case, the photographer case raises a First Amendment not just a First Amendment religious claim, which is my religion doesn't believe in, uh, in same-sex marriage, therefore I shouldn't have to photograph one, uh, but also raises an, a First Amendment claim that my photography is my own speech, it's my own artistic impression, and so I shouldn't be forced to, you know, to give somebody else's artistic impression of a wedding at all. That is, it's my first, you know, in the same way that like if I'm a dancer and you want to hire me for the wedding to dance and I say, well, I dance the flamenco, making me dance the bossa nova is, you know, a, an infringement on my, my expression. So the wedding, cake, the wedding cake people don't really have that claim. That is, they're not, they're just bringing a religion, a, a claim that it's, um, it's unconstitutional to apply the public accommodation statute in a way that violates my religious freedom. Uh, so far, those claims have not succeeded, um, in part because I think the folks who bring the claims are, you know, some of the claims are brought as enforcement actions by the government anti-discrimination agency, and I think they pick cases where they don't think they're gonna lose. That is, if, you know, and, and the thing is that when you layer the states that have these protections with the places where people are bringing the cases, it's not the best forums for the religious objectors to succeed, right? Where they're more likely to succeed are places where paradoxically they're not likely to be covered by a public accommodation statute in the, in the first place. That is, bakers and photographers in Mississippi don't have to worry about this. Right? It's like bakers in New Mexico, which is a kind of you know, moderately liberal, slightly libertarian state, or I think the other case involved Washington State, like really, you know, you wanna cut it? And, and the thing is, anti-discrimination laws have generally been held to be something states can apply to public businesses. That is, if you wanna run this kind of, you don't have a right to run this business in the first place, so it's not clear why you should have a right to run a discriminatory business. That being said, the federal RIFRA has been interpreted broadly and might be interpreted especially broadly by this administration 
with regard to places where there's some claim by um, by um, federal officials. So just to take an example, right now there are some there's some rules on the books about um, provide you know if you are a federal medical facility you have to provide medical care to people, but not clear that they're going to require that a doctor who has objections to the, I mean, the way the draft order is written, as I understand it, it would be objections to sex outside of marriage combined with you only believe marriage involves one man and one woman, then you might say, I, don't, I, I, don't, I shouldn't have to treat people who get sexually transmitted diseases because they're gay. And depending on how you read RIFRA, right, I mean, think about the aggressive reading of RIFRA in the contraceptive mandates case. So I think it really depends on what case goes up to the Supreme Court. The interesting thing is they have dodged repeatedly trying to take one of these cases. As they've gotten, the wedding cake case went up there, the photographer case went up there, and as far as I can tell, none of the justices seem particularly interested in deciding this. So they may just leave it to be decided in different states, however the states decide it. Or to quote Miss Jean Brody, it's the kind of case you'd like if you'd like that kind of case. Great, well thank you all very much. Thank you.